This is the first video in a series of videos going over basic concepts and inorganic reaction mechanisms. We can break inorganic reactions into several large classes. One involves isomerization about the metal. Another is ligand substitution, where ligand substitution can be broken down into three different classes. One is an associative mechanism, or A, where you form an intermediate, and then eject a ligand as such. There's the dissociative mechanism, or D, in which a metal compound first loses a ligand, and then another ligand will come in and substitute in the vacant site. And then there's the interchange mechanism. In which bond making and bond breaking proceeds in a concerted process. So in this you go through a transition state where you're making and breaking a bond. And then you form the substituted process. This can go through an ID or an IA-like process. In the dissociative interchange, you're breaking the X bond more at the transition state than you're forming the Y bond. And in the associative mechanism, you're making the Y bond more than you're breaking the X bond at the transition state. In addition, there's electron transfer reactions where you're oxidizing or reducing the metal complex. And then finally, ligand modification reactions in which a ligand attached to the metal center is having chemistry performed upon it. This can either occur with or without changes occurring at the metal center. Ligand modification reactions are incredibly important in processes like metal-based catalysis, biological reactions, and industrial processes. In this video, we're going to discuss isomerizations. Metal sites have specific stereochemistry, so how the ligands are oriented relative to one another about a central metal site. These can be in the form of cis versus trans ligands. In the case of octahedral compounds, you have facial versus meridial isomers. But in addition, you can also have delta versus lambda isomers, and these apply to chiral metal complexes. To understand the difference between a delta and a lambda isomer, we're going to look at cis, cobalt, ene2, Cl2+. Depending on how the ethylene backbone in the ene ligand wraps around the metal center, this can adopt a delta or a lambda orientation. So drawing these out.
we can draw the orientation in this way, or we can draw it like this. And these two are mirror images of each other. This is the delta isomer. And this is the lambda isomer. To understand where the delta and the lambda come from, I'm going to draw these as two superimposed triangles with the top triangle for these in yellow and the bottom triangle connecting the ligands in red. So to draw these out below. have that. I'm going to highlight where the nitrogens on the ene ligands are as blue spheres. Like that. Now we're going to connect the top nitrogen ligands to the bottom ligands with that ethylene backbone as such. like that. And if you notice, going from the top to the back, in the case of the delta isomer, you have a right-handed twist. So it's forming a right-handed helical type of twist as you go from the top to the bottom nitrogen. In the case of the lambda isomer, it's left-handed. So with the delta isomer, you have this right-handed helical twist going from the top ligand to the bottom ligand, while with the lambda isomer, you have a left-handed helical twist going from the top ligand to the bottom ligand. What we're now going to do is investigate how one could undergo an interchange between a lambda and a delta isomer at a metal site. Although we're using delta and lambda here, this, these are general processes by which ligands can rearrange themselves about metal sites. Now, depending on the type of metal you have, you can undergo two different isomerization processes when you have a six coordinate species. This can break down into processes involving so-called Berry pseudo rotations, or these can fall under twists. Berry pseudo rotations are typically found in compounds that have so called labile metal sites. In these, what you find is that. Ligand exchange is rapid relative to isomerization. In the case of twists, these are for kinetically inert metal sites. And in these cases, what's found is that isomerization is rapid relative to ligand exchange. 
We'll be talking about kinetically inert versus kinetically labile metal sites in the next video. But in these cases, the thing that's important is that with these very pseudo rotations, you have rapid ligand exchange relative to the isomerization. And in the twist, the isomerization is rapid relative to the ligand exchange, with the key word being relative. A Berry pseudo rotation refers to a ligand rearrangement in a five coordinate complex. And this relies on the fact that a trigonal bipyramidal complex is in equilibrium with a square pyramidal complex. And this is because the free energy difference between a trigonal bipyramidal and a square pyramidal compound is approximately zero. To show how this works, I'm going to draw a five coordinate compound with a trigonal bipyramidal geometry. In this compound, we can have ligand motion bringing this from this trigonal bipyramidal compound to a square pyramidal compound. So what we're going to do is we're going to bring the two axial ligands, ligands 2 and 3, this way. And we're going to move ligands 4 and 5 in the equatorial plane this way. What that's going to do is that's going to generate your square pyramidal complex. And as these continue moving, these now generate your trigonal bipyramidal complex, which if we reorient this, Ligands 4 and 5 are now in axial positions, and we have 2 and 3 in the equatorial positions. The reason this is called a pseudo-rotation is because we're not truly rotating where the ligands are. Instead, we're going through these interconverting trigonal bipyramidal and square pyramidal structures. And because of this, five coordinate compounds rarely display optical rotations due to the stereochemistry about the metal center themselves. Even when you start from a chiral five-coordinate complex, you dissolve that in solution. Because of the Berry pseudo rotation, you get rapid equilibrium between isomers. Applying this to ligand isomerization in a six-coordinate species, we're going to start off with our delta isomer. First step is the dissociation of one of those bidentate ligands. So you would get this five coordinate square pyramidal compound. If this ligand comes up and snaps back into place, you go back to the delta isomer. However, this can undergo a Berry pseudo rotation. In which case, we would get something like this. And then we would reform our square pyramidal species. And this ligand down here would come up, 
snapping into place in the back, forming your lambda isomer. In the case of inert compounds where ligand dissociation is slow, these compounds can undergo isomerization of the ligands about the metal center through twists, a Baylor twist or a Ray Dutt twist. In these cases, what you're doing is you're going from an octahedral structure to a trigonal prismatic transition state, and then back to an octahedral structure. Now in this case, it's easiest if I draw these as octahedrons and trigonal prisms in order to show how the ligands are rearranging. What I have drawn is the delta isomer of this octahedral metal complex. I've reoriented this such that we have three of the ligands coming up out of the plane and three of the ligands going back into the plane. These are connected by these linkers linking together the ligands that are attaching to the metal center. I've also devised a numbering scheme. If we take this and transfer this onto an octahedron, we have the ligands occupying the vertices and the red lines showing the connection of the various ligands relative to one another. So this octahedron here is a representation of the delta isomer with these red lines here representing the linkers between the ligands. Although fairly rigid, there is still molecular motion in these octahedral compounds. And because of this, every once in a while, these ligands will twist in such a way that you adopt a trigonal prismatic type structure. In the case of a Baylor twist, you can think of it as the top triangle comprising ligands one, two, and three twisting such that you form a prismatic structure. The prismatic structure looks like this. The ligands represented by 4, 6, and 5 remain in the same place, but that top triangle has twisted so that now you have that trigonal prism. Continuing along that twist will bring you back to an octahedron, but with the opposite stereochemistry about the metal center. You now have this, you've completed the twist, but it's now the lambda isomer. And if you notice, the positions of ligands 1, 2, and 3 have changed relative to 4, 5, and 6 on the bottom face. As those change by that twist, they bring along the linkers, linking the ligands together, reorient them, changing the chirality of the metal center. In the case of the ray dut twist, only two ligands are going to twist. In this case, we're going to move ligands 1 and 6 down like that. This will generate a different trigonal prismatic structure. This prismatic structure looks something like this, where continuing the twist, you get to your octahedral structure. As that twist continues through, atom two gets brought along, and now the rearrangement of the ligands are as such, where we've moved ligands one, two, and six relative to atoms three, four, and five. These twists are high in energy. They're therefore incredibly slow, but over long time scales at inert metal centers, you will see isomerization due to this twisting behavior.